And that's particularly relevant for INEP. Because the whole idea of INEP is about engaged Buddhism. It's about taking Buddhism off the meditation cushion, right? It's about taking Buddhism outside of the temple. It's about being engaged. It's about how we practice in our everyday life. So when it comes to sustainability mindfulness, sustainability practice, it's about how we interact with our physical world, right? So Venerable Tenzin Palma was talking about how we interact with people, how we interact socially, emotionally. This kind of practice is about how we interact with our physical world. And every single day, we make so many choices about how we do that. Um, one of the main ways that we make choices about that is as consumers. And I know that this kind of sounds like a bad word, because we've, we've heard so much about consumerism. But that's a different thing, right? Consumer means we consume. And every single one of us consumes. We consume oxygen, we consume air, we consume water, we consume food, we need some kind of shelter, we need some kind of clothing, right? We consume. Consumerism is when you take it too far, when being a consumer is your identity, when that's like your religion, right? But consumer, that's something all of us do. Animals do, we do, everyone does, right? So every single time we consume, we have a chance to be mindful consumers. We have a chance to think about what we're doing. It's not an easy thing, but neither is meditation practice. It's the same kind of thing, right? So when you have the, the opportunity to make a choice, you get to ask yourself a series of questions, right? So for example, is this socially just, right? If you're buying a new shirt, right? or you're, you're buying a pair of shoes, right? You can think, who made it? Did they get a living wage? What were their working conditions, right? Does this match my values? Is this socially just? When you pick up a bottle of water, as we discussed yesterday, one of the questions yesterday, you pick up a small plastic bottle of water, right? It's a, it's a question to ask yourself, is this environmentally sustainable? So is it socially just? Is it environmentally sustainable? Right? What is it made from? What, what is plastic made from? Oil. Yeah, it's made from oil, right? It's made from a non-renewable resource, right? So is it environmentally sustainable? No, right? So you can ask, what is it made from? How long am I really going to use this for? Right? Is it just a few sticks and then I'm throwing it away? What happens after I throw it away? Where does it go to, right? Is there an alternative? Is there something else I could be doing? Is there something else I can use? Right? So then the final question is, is it economically viable? So we have, is it socially just? Is it environmentally sustainable? And is it economically viable? Right? Because I could find a t-shirt that's fair trade, it's socially just, it's organic certified, it's environmentally sustainable, right? but it costs $100 and has a nice name brand on it. Well, for me, that's not economically viable, right? If I buy a $100 t-shirt, I can't have dinner, right? So you have to think of how, how to balance, right? You have to think about, is it something that I can do continuously? What are the alternatives? Is there another thing that I could look for, another option, right? So I think everyone in this room already knows about this, these basic points, right? But the challenge, right, same as Buddhism, is practice. It's one thing to read about it, it's one thing you know, to, to know it, but it's another thing to actually practice it. So I think a lot of us, we might be doing okay on right view, maybe on right intention, might even be doing right speech, might be able to talk about it, but when it comes to right action, sometimes we have a bit of a challenge, right? That's something that we all need to work on a bit. And there have already been many um, references to how, even within this conference, there were things we could have done to improve, right? So that it matches our values, that it was more mindful, right? Um, it's easy to go in the same way that in our day-to-day -day life, it's, we, we often go for what's easy, what's the short-term easy option. But that's not mindfulness, right? And it's not sustainable. Um, I'll just give one example, because we're talking about what we do as individuals, but that affects what happens in our organizations, in our companies. We had some um, government leaders here, so what happens in our governments, right? 
what happens in our temples. Um, I want to give an example from Thailand, actually. I've lived in Sri Lanka for the last 12 years. Before that, I lived in Thailand for a couple of years. Um, and in Thailand, they still do the practice of uh, Bindabad, right? Sri Lanka Bindabad, right? And when I first lived there, I lived in a rural area, and I, I think most people here are familiar with the practice, right? The monks go out on the alms ground, right? And they collect food from the lay people. Well, when I first saw that, I lived in a rural area, and people prepared the food at home, and they took it from the bowl from their house, and they dished it into the monk's bowl, right? Well, only recently, I realized there have been a lot of changes in that practice, right? If you go to many Thai temples now, the what people are giving is saitung, right? It's inside a plastic bag. It's inside a styrofoam box. Every single item of food is in a separate plastic bag, right? So every month who's coming back is coming back with lots and lots of plastic bags or lots of styrofoam containers, right? So I'm not saying that we should feel bad or say this is wrong, but this is an opportunity for practice. This is an opportunity for those monks to be able to help the people that they're, their lay people that they're working with to be mindful in another way to help them practice. So I have just one more point. Um, I have just one more thing that's particularly relevant to, to this group because I know a lot of people here are actually working very hard on sustainability issues. Right? We have a lot of people that are working on social issues and environmental issues and compared to almost any other place that we are, people are really trying to be mindful, right? They're trying to be mindful about gender issues, about marriage, right? Thinking about those things, thinking about oppressed groups, thinking about turning off the light switch, how much water they use in the shower, right? We have a lot of people here that are working on these kinds of things. But there's one point that we often have a hard time discussing in our social and environmental NGOs, and that's economic sustainability. Right? The financial sustainability of the work that we're doing. And I say this because I've had, I've had the privilege to be able to visit a lot of INF groups on the ground. And this issue comes up a lot. Right? Wow. There's a lot of the groups that they have a hard time talking about money, and they have a hard time getting money, and they're dependent on some kind of grant money. Right? which often means that their work isn't very sustainable, right? They might be doing great things, but the moment the donor funds stop, their activities also stop, right? So, and it also slows down their work, right? I can think of many, many examples where it's like, oh, we've been wanting to do this, we have this really great idea, but we're just waiting for the donor, or we're waiting for some kind of funding, or we're waiting for somebody to give us money to build this, or to do this, or to make this happen, right? So this is something that I also would like us to cha challenge us, to talk about more openly, and to really think about solutions for. And I'm saying this from personal experience, because the organization that I work with, um, Sevalanka, um, I've been working with for 12 years, it's a 20-year-old organization, um, it's, it's basically, it's mostly been dependent on donor funding. It's been dependent on international aid. And I think most people know we had a tsunami in Sri Lanka. There was a lot of aid funding that came in then. Um, we had a war in Sri Lanka. There's been a lot of support for that. And that, those funds were for emergency work, right? And now the emergency period is thankfully over, right? And we're trying to move into more development work. And the international funds are going down. They're going down very quickly. So we definitely have to make some kind of transition. We have to find a way to be financially sustainable, to be economically sustainable. And this is something that I found with almost every group I've talked to in India, in Myanmar and Indonesia. Right? This is a challenge everyone is facing. And I want to just share one of the things that we're doing that has seemed to help just a little bit. Um, last year, we started a new initiative, um, Save Lanka, that's called the Good Market, right? And it's to help with this kind of a transition process. Good Market means it's good for the planet, good for the country, good for society, and good for you. Right? And it's a market space that's meant for a physical market, right, where people kind of come together, 
and all the people that have stalls there are trying to do some kind of social work or environmental work, but they all have some kind of financial sustainability strategy. Right? They're doing something to make it sustainable. So for example, there's a group that works with people with disabilities, right? And they have people, blind people, that are trained in massage. So they're getting massage, they're getting payment, that payment helps support their organization. There's people doing work with organic, there's people doing fair trade handicrafts, many different kinds of things, okay? The main point is that it's actually working, right? We didn't expect this. When we started, we had 32 vendors, 32 groups, and we never expected much more than that. And now, in about it's been 10 months, we have 94 vendors and 25 more on the waiting list. We've run out of space, right? And what's been really nice about it is the consumer response. People really want to, they want to be mindful consumers. They want to buy things that support their values and match what they care about. But we need to help make it a little easy for them, right? Make it a little bit, little bit easier. So I just wanted to, to end by saying that there's a real lesson here. Because often when people are talking about environmental issues, they talk about it as being something that's really scary. It's overwhelming. And that makes us sometimes feel kind of fearful and also powerless, right? But instead, you, you can't build a movement on no's and don'ts, right? You can't get people behind something that's all about don't do this, don't do that, don't use too much water, don't use plastic, right? Instead, it has to be about an opportunity. It's an opportunity to practice mindfulness. It's an opportunity to be creative. It's an opportunity to discuss not what we don't want, but what kind of world do we want, right? And at the good market, people decided they want a world where there's a community, sense of community, there's live music, there's really good food, that's the kind of world we want, right? So I just like to, to say that and suggest that we as Buddhists might have a role to play in helping people think about how to be mindful consumers. Thank you very much. Now, um, before having a discussion, let me remind the venerables that at 11.50 there will be a, a bell that will be rang, And then uh, please proceed to the dining hall to have lunch. Now, um, I would like to ask the uh, speak speakers, now we have five speakers, to ask questions amongst yourselves so that you can bring out something that wasn't maybe elaborated or not really sort of um, um, said, so that we can take it from there. Anybody would like to ask questions to other? Everything 
can only be sustained if the religious values are followed as they are to help society, not for me to gain heaven, not for me to gain advantage on others and take use of that and I go to heaven. That is not the thing. So I am very glad that the Buddhist which is actually known to be known the monasteries and the living meditation, now going out and engaging in the society and I hope your effort will bear fruit. Not only here, it's because Buddhism is all over the world and with all your energy you can spread it. Thank you for inviting me here and Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> I have a question for Venerable Chao Wei. <laughs> um, so the presentation was on the uh, sustainability of marriage, and I am very, very grateful that you had an opportunity to share the work that you're doing on that subject. But I also know that your organization is also doing work related to environmental sustainability, and I wonder if you could just have a few moments to hear about some of that work that you're doing as well. Uh, actually, uh, we have an organization that is called Life Conservationist Association, and the major task is to protect the animals. So actually, we think our efforts have to reach our last year for uh, 20, more than 20 years, actually. And uh, we, we promote it and we successfully legalize wildlife uh, animal protection and life animal protection act. Okay, and then along with that, we also uh, initiated um, a movement such as anti-nuclear movement in Taiwan. And uh, also, we, uh, we, we also run a, a very successful campaign against legalization of casinos in Taiwan. So uh, with our efforts, together with other social movement groups, so far, Taiwan hasn't been able to legalize casinos. Very good. Any other questions from the speakers to each other? No? Okay, so let me open this up to the venerables because the venerables will be leaving in two, three minutes. Only one question. Venerables? between environmental rights and human rights. For example, I have learned from somewhere that, that the artist is naturally able to accept uh, 300,000 new human a day. That uh, is really not exist number. But in reality, the art ha has to accept only, uh, has to accept 500,000 new human a day. Uh, that's, that's one of many conflict happening between nature and human. So, what would be uh, the best solution for this problem, according to your opinion? Do you understand? as a conflict, right? Because we humans were part of the environment, right? So I know that some people, when they talk about the three things I mentioned, economic, social, environmental, they draw it as a three-legged stool, 
right? To say you need all three legs to, to manage. But actually, that's not really the way that things work, right? Because actually, every the environment, it's more like an onion. You know when you slice an onion and you can see all the different rings inside? Well, the outside ring, that's the environment. And everything else is inside of that, right? And then the next ring in, that's our society, right? And then inside of that is our economy, because the economy is a social system. It's something we came up with, right? So there's not really a conflict between man and environment. Man is part of the environment. And these kinds of challenges, they're complex issues. So we've got to figure out how to make compromises, what are the best way to deal with them. But it's not an either or kind of situation, in my opinion. Right. Okay, thank you. Now, Graham Holtz, would you like to, to go for lunch, please? Thank you very much. Please. Yes, yes. Yeah. I thought you had to get